You know, today we're jumping into part two of our series, Free at Last, a study in the book of Galatians, and it's going to be good stuff. I did uh, watch the uh, video cast and listen to the podcast from last week. Can we get a for Pastor Joseph, who did a fairly amazing job? introducing the series and bringing the word. And I watched one sermon and a video clip where at the end he got really angry and he was kicking cardboard boxes and punching holes in them. I'm like, wow, this guy needs some uh, anger management counseling. But uh, it was a great message. I hope you were here. It really laid a great foundation for where we're gonna go and continue on tonight. Uh, And I also wanna thank you for being a church that uh, understands that we are ascending church, that everything God does through the Father's house is it's bigger than us and bigger than what we do in this room. So I want to thank you for releasing, sending me and the other pastors that have opportunities to go and speak. And last weekend, I got to preach at one of our network churches in Spokane, Washington. And it was a great time and did their weekend services and then a night meeting with their dream team. And it was just a incredible uh, time with them. And then uh, laid over for Tuesday, and there was an ARC event. ARC's a group that we're a part of, church planning organization. Many of you know that. And I got to minister to leaders on my birthday on Tuesday. I got to equip some pastors. What a great way to spend your birthday, all right? So just thanks for being a church that gets that and that sends us out. We love you for that. If we weren't here and didn't have you in the base of authority that's represented, then we couldn't really be sent, could we? So it's your strength, it's your grace. Well, let's talk about freedom, shall we? You know, the word freedom is found more in the book that we're studying tonight than in any other New Testament letter. It's found in the book of Galatians. And God's desire for you, lean in, get this, everybody here, Everybody watching, everybody in Napa, God's desire for you is to walk in complete freedom, to experience freedom internally and externally, emotionally, spiritually, in every way for you to be free, and then once you secure that freedom, to live in that freedom, to not go back again to those things that used to have chains on your life, and so that is God's desire, isn't it? Let's just jump right into the word. I'm going to read John 8, the words of Jesus in the voice translation. Here we go. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who commits sin surrenders his freedom to sin. Oh, anybody been there? I think most of us have, unless you're under the age of four. You still have, you just don't realize it yet. Anyone who sins surrenders his freedom to sin. He's a slave to sin's power. Even a household slave does not live in the home like a member of the family, but a son belongs there forever. So think of it this way. If the son comes to make you free, you will really be free. Or as you sang just a couple minutes ago, whom the son sets free is free indeed, is truly and completely free. Freedom from the inside out. Everybody say, from the inside out. If you're looking for a title, that's the name of the message tonight. From the inside out, I am free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, free at last. That's what we're talking about. Now, the key verse for this, te- um, this book, this letter, and this series, uh, the reoccurring theme in Galatians is found in chapter five, verse one. So we're gonna go there, and then we'll backtrack and dig into chapter two and have our Bible study time together, and I may just preach a little bit, all right? So all that will happen on a Saturday night. Galatians 5.1 from the message paraphrase says it this way. Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. NIV says, stand fast in the liberty that Christ has given you and do not be entangled again or ensnared again with a yoke of bondage. You know, one of the disappointing things I've seen in the life of believers and being a pastor and counseling and teaching and walking with folks is people who will experience a season of freedom And then they get out of the word, they get out of church, they get bored with it, it gets predictable. And there's this subtle thing that happens where the allure and the draws that we escape from begin to tantalize and call our name and whisper to us. And the life that we used to live, that Jesus so graciously freed us from, we look back and we only remember the good parts of it. Remember the deception of it, and we we step back into the chains. But listen, guys, there is a cry in the human heart for freedom. There's a cry in each one of us. No matter what level of freedom you're walking in, there's this cry that wants to be completely free. And that cry needs to come out of us. Yeah, go ahead and think about Mel Gibson riding back and forth really fast on that horse with his face painted blue. And what did he say? They may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. 
How many of you have not watched that movie? You're looking at me like, what is he doing up there? Well, go home and check it out. It's going to be edifying for you. Now, the context of this letter I'm talking about, it was written from the Apostle Paul to all the churches in the region of Galatia, which would be across modern-day Turkey, the whole southern half of modern-day Turkey, and Antioch of Syria, a main port city as you enter the area of Galatia where they were first called Christians at Antioch. So Paul's writing to the church. You see, when... The early church started in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit was poured out. It was just really a few months, maybe a year or two, and persecution really started to happen to these New Testament believers. Because anywhere God pours out his spirit, the enemy has a, a, an alternative plan. And I don't think the enemy really strategizes that much. He just more reacts when God starts moving. There, there's persecution. But how many know God takes what the enemy means for evil and he turns it for good? So as the church was persecuted and they were scattered uh, among the known world, actually those that went out from Jerusalem began to go up into Galatia and into Thessalonica and into Athens and Corinth and ended up in Rome and then on into Europe. And everywhere the believers were scattered, they ended up being evangelists with the Gospels of Christ. Because you can't put out the fire of God. And so instead of it squelching the church, persecution actually multiplied the church. And if you'll stay filled with the Holy Spirit, whatever attack is on your life, whatever persecution is hitting your life, it will only increase the fire of God and you'll be a greater witness in trial than you were during the, the calm and peaceful times. You know, in this point in history, no one beyond Judaism, which was primarily uh, contained in Israel, had heard about this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, much less the Messiah, much less that Messiah had come. And his name is Jesus of Nazareth, and he's delivering and freeing people. So Paul goes out and begins to preach in Antioch and Syria and different cities, and he's planting churches, and people are getting saved that have never heard about this God of Israel. How could they even believe that? You know why they believed? Because the gospel was accompanied with power. It wasn't just, hey, I got some Old Testament scrolls from my friends down in Jerusalem, lean in for a Bible study and let me talk to you about ancient Judaism. No, it says, Paul said, I came in a demonstration of the power of God. So when Paul showed up in Antioch and Corinth and Ephesus, there were miracles, there were signs and wonders. Sometimes he'd be preaching in a house, the house would be packed, and before he could finish his sermon, the Holy Spirit would fall and everybody in the room would start speaking in tongues. And because of that, the church was birthed in fire and in passion. But it didn't take long, just a few years after the church was birthed in Antioch and deceivers, um, those who wanted to come in and divide and destroy the work of God, they began to show up. And so those who started in freedom, they went back to legalism. Those who started loving Jesus started depending on rules and mixing their true faith and the gospel with heresy and false doctrine. You see Athens and Corinth and Antioch and these, these cities, they were Greek cities and they were monotheistic for sure. There was a God on every corner, an idol in every house and they, they served a thousand gods. So they started mixing it up, a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of this and that, nothing new. We do it in America in the 21st century. A little Jesus, a little new age, a little self-help, a little this, a little that. And the gospel comes to say, no, Jesus must be central. And there can be no mixture. You can have no other gods before him. So Paul shows up, and in review, you guys studied uh, chapter one last week with Pastor Joseph and keyed in on verses six through nine. Verse six, check it out again. Paul said, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. The different gospel is a word we use called heresy. Has anybody ever heard that word? It's kind of a church word, but heresy has been known to mean false doctrine, but really heresy is a mixture. So heresy is never just a big stack of lies. The enemy doesn't come and say, hey, Jesus is not God and I am. No, what he does is he takes truth and then he laces it, infuses it, and wraps it up in a lie. So you have partial truth and partial lie, and it actually leads you away from the living God, even though there's truth involved in it. That's always been the strategy of every self-respecting cult, is to take some truth, wrap it in a lie, and sell it to the masses. And so he says, hey, uh, there's a gospel that's being twisted, and here's what it was. The sacrifice of Christ is not enough. 
The grace of God is not enough. Yeah, maybe you got started in grace, but now you're gonna need to earn your salvation. You're gonna need to work your way into righteousness. You're gonna need to add some rules on top of that grace. And Paul addresses it, and he does it just straight up, no mistake made. So we're gonna jump into chapter two. This will be our content tonight. Uh, a lot of notes. I'll speak fast. You listen fast. We'll get out of here and go eat some dinner together. All at the same restaurant. Ready? Let's go. <laughs> Galatians 2. I'm going to read 4, 5, 15, and 16. Some people who were pretending to be our brothers and sisters were brought in to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. They wanted to enslave us and force us to follow their Jewish regulations, but we did not listen to them for a single moment, for we did not want to look at this, confuse you into thinking that salvation can be earned. Anytime you think that right standing with God can be earned, you enter into confusion. It goes on to say, by being circumcised, talk about that later, and by obeying Jewish laws. We know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law, and we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be right with God because of our faith in Christ, he says it again, not because we've obeyed the law, second time, for no one will ever be made right, third time, made right with God by what? Obeying the law or keeping the rules. So Paul's very redundant here. He says, I, I want you to get this. I'm gonna say it again and again and again. You're never made right with God by obeying the law and keeping the rules. We are justified by faith, right? We're saved through grace, and it's the grace of God and faith in the saving work of the cross that justifies us. We use that biblical term. It means just as if I'd never sinned. In right standing with God, and, and Paul is clear on this, you'll never be made right by keeping the rules. So here is the divide, the schism, the, the heresy, this other gospel. It was this. Is it rules and relationship or relationship, then we gotta keep the rules. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. It's all relationship with Jesus, amen? Now, in the Reformation, the 1500s, Martin Luther, he really brought back justification by faith. And that's a theological term that might be a flyby, but it applies to every one of us. Because if you've been around a legalistic church, a dead religion, a cult, or even in churches that love God and are well-meaning, we can begin to go down a slippery slope where we, we understand justification by faith, but then we throw in a little bit of works. But you still gotta do this and do that to please God. I love this quote right here. It'll come up on the screen. The deepest heresy of all which corrupts believers is salvation by works. The root of every schism and heresy from which the church has suffered has been the effort to earn salvation rather than to receive it. The reason so much of our preaching is ineffective is that we're calling people up to work in order to please God instead of beholding the God who has done the work for us all. Very well said, amen? Now, Acts 15 actually parallels the book of Galatians. In fact, many theologians believe that Paul wrote this letter while he was headed back to Jerusalem, Acts 15, something called the Jerusalem Council. And there was a dividing point in the history of the church that's well recorded about this whole thing. Well, is it by works or is it by grace? So let's take a right-hand turn and, and go back to the book of Acts and, and the talk, the debate that happened in the Jerusalem Council, Acts 15.1. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judah arrived and began to teach the believers, unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently, vehemently. Do you use that in your everyday vocabulary? Throw it in there, it's an effective word. It means they argued with passion and intensity and in anger. They weren't letting this go. We need to resolve this issue. Are these Gentile believers who know nothing of Judaism, are we expecting them to be circumcised as grown male adults and then keep all of our traditions and our food and dietary laws and our worship laws, or is it simply the saving grace of Jesus? And Paul said, this is worth getting in an argument over and I ain't backing off till we get this straight. That's what happened in Acts 15. Now let's think about the application and the ramifications of this. One of Paul's protégés, a guy named Titus, Titus was a good Greek boy, lived up in Antioch and came to Jesus because of this message of salvation. 
Titus got filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, in love with God, and he's doing good. And then, and then all of a sudden, these Judaizers, these rule enforcers, show up from Jerusalem. And they said, hey, Titus, it's not enough just to know Christ. If you're gonna be right with God, you gotta get circumcised. And Titus is like, circumcised? Yeah, circumcision. He's like, what? I've never heard of that. What, what is circumcision? What does that mean? Looks over at Paul, his father in the faith. He says, Paul, what is circumcision? And Paul's like, <laughs> Barnabas, <laughs> you tell him. Yeah, go ahead, tell him. <laughs> and Barnabas was like, well, yeah, uh, Philip, you're the new guy. You tell him, Philip. <laughs> and they're, they're expecting these Judaizers, these rule keepers, to enforce this unrealistic Old Testament legislation on New Testament believers. And so Paul gets in this debate and he says, hey, this is not about rules, it's about relationship. And I, I could read you the whole chapter of 15, it's so good, but the conclusion, finally the senior elder, James, was the, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, he's the old guy. And James stands up at the end of this debate and he says, it is my judgment then, that we should abolish all these rules and not make it difficult for those who are coming to God. And I love that verse. What do you say as a church, we get rid of all the rules and regulations that are outside the realm of grace and let's not make it difficult for people that are turning to God. Your religious tradition makes it difficult for people to see Jesus. Your denominational upbringing possibly makes it quite difficult for people to see Jesus. Here's what people need to see. The cross of Christ, the unconditional love of God, the Savior's heart for them. They're gonna work everything else out. They don't need a book and an Old Testament pamphlet to go, hey, do these thousands of things. Well, just so you get an idea of how intense and ridiculous the rule keeping became, it started out on Mount Sinai. How many rules did the uh, Old Testament Israelites have? It's a Bible study quiz, I got one answer. Okay, we're, we're way behind the curve. Okay, yeah, 10. She was right. The Ten Commandments, right? Charlton Heston, he comes down the mountain with the slabs of granite. Old school, all right. But here's what it parlayed into by the time Jesus showed up on the scene. They had 613 rules, 248 commandments, 365 prohibitions, 1,521 amendments to those commandments. And if you were gonna be righteous by keeping the law, you had to keep them all. And that's what it'd turn into. Now, rules as a way to righteousness or pleasing God is obviously futile, but here's been my observation. It creates some things that are very unhealthy in people. Three main characteristics, there's probably more, but it, they create pride, frustration, and rebellion. Rules without grace create spiritual pride in those who feel they're keeping the rules so they're better than the guy who's not. It creates frustration leading to despair in those who are giving it their all and they're still messing up. So I just can't measure up to the standard you guys are telling me to keep. And then it creates rebellion. Rebellion in those who are being required to keep the rules of someone else's religion. Now, many religions and religious people are bringing others into bondage through um, these rules and regulations were really with the best of intentions. They were just handed down to them and they're handing them down to the next generation. Simply taught and trained that this is how you please God. Jesus said to a religious crowd one day in Mark 7, he said, and so you nullify or make of no effect the word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. Now look at that, that's an amazing verse. You make of no effect, you nullify the word of God in order to hand down tradition. And this is only one example among many other things. You know, some of the rules I was raised with, I was raised in a legalistic church. Now, they preached the Bible, they preached Jesus, real Holy Spirit, real heaven, real hell. You could get saved in the church I grew up in, but then they had Jesus plus a lot of rules. Now, I'm gonna share just a few of them with you so you have context. And actually, I have my beautiful sister here tonight. Susie, would you stand up? She grew up with me in the same church. Susie and Randy Roseburg, Oregon, and she'll remember these as I reflect on them those. Now, if you were not raised in a legalistic, rule-centered church, these are gonna seem silly, ridiculous, borderline unbelievable. But for those of you who came out of a religious system, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna resonate. How many of you came out of a legalistic, rule-bound church environment? Let me just check. Napa, that's probably about 30, 40% of this room, probably the same out there. So uh, in no particular order, 
Here's a few of them that we were under. If we wanted to please God and stay saved and be holy. The first one, no secular music. Secular music is of the devil. It's the devil's music. So you have, if you listen to non-Christian music, it was a sin. Uh, but that was kind of frustrating because the Christian music back then was really lame. So I'm always sneaking on the AM radio, right? And I got my eight tracks, my black market eight tracks, you know? Cause, and then some guys some, some, at the very front end of the contemporary Christian music scene, late 70s, this guy wrote a song, Larry Norma's his name, and here's the title. Why does the devil have all the good music? I'm like, yeah, he does. Praise God, that's changed. Here's another one we were under, no tattoos. Sinners tattooed their bodies, not believers. Um, there goes all of our young adult community, if that was true today. <laughs> no alcohol whatsoever. Drink a glass of wine, go to hell. Do not pass go, straight, <laughs> you're gone. Here's one for the ladies. So this was our church. No makeup or jewelry for women. That, that's just not right. That's cruel and inhumane. How many you know we all need a little help? I'm being kind. I'm just speaking the truth in love. <laughs> Later on, that got downgraded to jewelry and makeup in moderation by the time we got into the 80s. Oh, here's one. My sister will remember this one. No pants for women. Remember that? Yeah, you do. Okay, I gotta bust her out a little bit. Here was my sister's MO because we, we were those that rebelled against legalism and she rebelled far worse than me, That's, as I remember. Would that be accurate? Well, we'll debate that later. But So here's what we do. She had to go to church with a, or school with a dress on in the winter in Oregon. And I, I watched this as we go to junior high. We rode the bus. We lived out in Garden Valley. And she'd have her little backpack with her, quote, books in it. But guess what was in the backpack? A pair of Levi's all rolled up. So as soon as we got to school, man, Susie, whew, straight to the bathroom, throws on her jeans. She's with her friends all day. And then right before we go home, she magically went back into this dress. So why? Because of rules and regulation that created rebellion. So the sin wasn't wearing jeans. It was lies and deception and all manner of things that she had to repent of at some point. I hope you have. All right, let's move. I'm just having fun because she's my sister. Here's another one. No going to the movie theater or the bowling alleys. Serious. Those were dens of iniquity. We didn't go in dens of iniquity. And, and one more. I could go on all night. No dancing. Because body movement was sensual and sinful. <laughs> really? I guess they never saw me dance. <laughs> if you saw me dance, sensual would be the last word that would come into your mind. You might think awkward, pity, concern, he needs counseling, but sensual would not be one of them. <laughs> so the first thing I want you to do, I'm going to run out of time before I run out of content. So, hey, keep the band from coming up because they scare me. I'll call them up. It's a holiday weekend. I'm preaching till 10 o'clock. <laughs> and that's why I love you. Okay, there's three new guys. You're like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> but we'll order in pizza and beer because we're a non-religious group. I'm just, I'm just. <laughs> I just want him back. He's like, this is my people, my church, my crowd. So the first thing I want you to do, I want you to lose your religion. Lose it. Because a religion apart from grace and the true gospel actually distances people from God. Religious people end up serving and following a God of their own making, a man-made system that uses scripture to support its decisions or its deception and bondage. You know, in the Webster's Dictionary, which where we get our context for religion, it means the service and worship of God. Pretty benign, pretty clear. A system of beliefs. But in the Greek, the word in your Bible, it actually means ceremonial observance and piety. So the Greek word for religion means keep the rules and look the part, all right? Now, in the Bible, there are 10 references uh, of religion or religious. And then there's a lot of times where Jesus spoke and rebuked religious leaders, and it was never pretty. But do you know all of the references of religion, except for one kind of sideways rebuke in James, are negative when it comes to religion. That's why I want you to lose your religion. Yeah. That's me in the corner. That's me in the... I thought you'd have my back a little better, but thanks for the quartet. Well done, all four of you. <laughs> I guess that's an old song now. 
Here's a couple references. Amos 5, 21. God says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Acts 17. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I noticed that you are very religious in every way. Yet this was an idol-worshiping, godless, pagan culture. Acts 26, 5, Paul said this, I have been a member of the Pharisees, the strictest sect of religion. He wasn't bragging. What he was saying is, and while I was, I was arresting Christians and having them offered up to be killed and sacrificed. One more, Hebrews 10, 11. It's just a sampling. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Here's what I want you to get tonight. Religion doesn't work. Yeah, a system of belief, of course, as long as grace is first and the love of God is first, but never try to get people closer to God by saying, here's our rules and our regulations. Why? Because it doesn't happen from the outside in. Religion is outside in. Pay your tithe, come to the deal, ride the bike, go on the missions trip, sign up for the class, do, 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 earn your way up the ladder. But grace says, I'm gonna change your heart. And Jesus said this, if you love me, what's going to happen? You're going to keep my commandments. So the fruit of it sometimes looks the same. You read your Bible. You tithe. You do go on the missions trip. You do all those things, but not out of a motivation that's external from someone else's expectations, but out of a motivation of relationship with a loving God. And because you love him, you want to tithe. Because you love him, you don't want to miss church. Because you love him, you want to serve somebody. Well, I'm preaching on the weekend. Come on. (laughs) Oh, I got two more big points. Here we go. I'm going to pick up the pace. He wants you free from religion. He wants you free from hypocrisy. Look at verse 11. So Peter came to Antioch, and Paul said this, I had to oppose him to his face. Would you say those words with me? To his face. In the face. You got it. For what he did was very wrong. And when he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity, here's our word again, of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. What was it? You know what hypocrisy is, right? You know what a hypocrite is. It's a Greek word, the old word from the Latin. It means to wear a mask. It means to stand on a stage and become somebody else. And see, so Peter, he's all free up in Antioch of Syria. He's hanging out with the Gentiles. He's under grace, and they're just having the time of their life, and he's not worried about all the food regulations. Hey, pass the bacon, all good, man. We're under grace. And then the Judaizers show up, And they begin to put the pressure on Peter, even the friends of James, so the heavyweights from the church. And what did Peter do? He's walking down the street. There's his Gentile friends. And he looks the other way. And they're like, hey, hey, Peter. What's up, man? We missed you at the prayer meeting last night. Peter, Peter. And he's just looking the other way. Hey, I don't know those guys, man. (laughs) I, I I I I don't know who they're talking to, but it's not me. And he became a hypocrite. Now, we're talking about Peter, the rock, the founder of the New Testament church. What does that mean for you and me? We gotta be careful, guys, that we don't wear a mask, that we don't begin to say, hey, on Sunday I look like this, and then on Monday I put on this mask, and when I'm on the golf course, I got this one, and when I'm with my old friends, I got this mask. Sincerity. Be who you are. Because what happens is, if we put on a mask and we have 15 different personas to fit every scenario, look at verse 13 again. As a result... Other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. I never really saw this before that, you know, I used to think hypocrisy in the church just messed with people outside the church. I've had a lot of people tell me, I don't go to the Father's house, there's a bunch of hypocrites down there. I know people, and they start naming names, like, easy, buddy. You ever heard that? I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. And it's so tempting to say, well, one more is not gonna hurt, come on. (laughs) Seat for you. (laughs) But I don't, because... I'm filled with grace and patience and such. Not as rebellious as my sister. (laughs) But look at this. Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. I want you to get this. When I wear a mask, it makes you stumble. 
When I become something else in a different context and wear a facade and jump on the stage and I live and act, not only does it trip up the unbelievers, but it actually causes strong believers. Barnabas was one of the church planters, a leader in the house, and this hypocrisy of Peter made him stumble. Now, we don't have to be flawless or sinless, do we? We just gotta be sincere and honest. You know, sometimes I, over the years, I've had a tendency to overshare, okay? Sometimes I'm a little too transparent, and I say a few things. I'm like, mm, maybe I push the envelope, and I'm always telling you my faults and weaknesses. And, you know, you've heard me say this a lot. Hey, you're in a room full of jacked up people. <laughs> and some people resent that. You know, I've actually had people over the years leave the Father's house and, and actually would tell me this, something along these lines. We just need a church where the lead pastor has it together a bit more. And I'm like, well, give me a hug on your way out. Come on, let's hug it out because I'm gonna be this messed up tomorrow, right? But do they really want a pastor that has it together or do they just want, want one that appears, Right? The priest looks holy. The pastor looks righteous. The leader looks like they have. See, because hypocrisy doesn't care what's under the scene. We just want the surface and the facade to look good. So we're going to be real. We're broken people being healed. We're messed up people being fixed. None of your pastors have it together. We're all broken sinners saved by grace, but we don't want to be hypocrites. But if I tick you off, I'll repent. If I offend you, I'll try to mend it. When I sin, I come to the cross, and I sin. Probably not as frequently as Susie, but I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop. Okay, I'm gonna stop, all right? I'm just having too much fun. Well, let me, let me oh, two things before I hit the last point. Um, two ways you're gonna get free of, of hypocrisy, you ready? Intimacy and community. Intimacy and community, if you're taking notes. Intimacy with the Father is where you find out who you really are. You find your identity, and then you just start being yourself. You're not as concerned if people like you or don't like you. It's just like Paul didn't care, even with the elders and the apostles in Jerusalem. It's like your opinion doesn't matter to me. There's only one opinion. So intimacy will free you of hypocrisy, and then community. You need a, a, a Paul in your life that will get in the face and to the face confront the facade of your life, amen? And the final thing is, in this chapter, Paul says, I want you to experience freedom from sin. So freedom from religion, dead works and rules. Freedom from hypocrisy, wearing a mask, and freedom from sin. Because what about the bondage and the need for freedom on the inside of all of us tonight? You know, my desires, my thought life, my attitudes. This is the real heart of the gospel. Because I think all of us can relate to the contradiction that happens in us, right? Right? You know, Paul was the guy who wrote this, oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, being conformed even into uh, being willing to suffer as he did in his death. He just wanted to know Christ. But then Paul wrote this, but I find a conflict in myself because the things I wanna do, I don't do. And the things I hate, I end up doing. And when I try to be righteous, I find this war, this internal conflict that always caused me to fall yet again. And he got so frustrated. If you read this in Romans, he finally cries out, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? And he turns right around. He says, thanks be to God who has given me deliverance through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you've experienced this conflict of, well, Dave, I think I'm free from religion and I try not to be a hypocrite, but sure enough, I got this internal thing going on. The thing I hate, I end up doing. The thing I, I wanna do, I don't do. How can I get free from this? And it's real simple, but it's profound. Lean in. You gotta take it to the cross. Would you say that with me? Take it to the cross. This is a profound theological truth. See, because most of us realize that Jesus died on the cross for us, but do you realize that you died on the cross with him? Positionally, you died on the cross. That's what the waters of baptism are all about. When you get baptized in that tank, it's more than just, hey, a public sign of an inward work. No, there's something that happens by faith. The body, the mass of sin, all of your track record goes down as Jesus went into the grave. We go into the waters and we come up in resurrection power, no longer a slave to sin. 
Now, does your sin motor still work? Oh, yes, it does. Do you still have options? Oh, yes, you do, but here's what you have. You have the power and the right to live above sin because at the moment of water baptism, you're freed from the law of sin and death and you can live by the grace of God. You can live in triumph. You can live as an overcomer because of the cross. Now, you're saved once, your name written in the Lamb's book of life, but the Apostle Paul said this, I die daily, meaning there is a crucifixion of my old man and old desires, and if I'll keep coming back to the cross with all of those things, I will keep living a resurrected life. Well, let me read this last portion of scripture. Maybe it's the last one, no promises. Galatians 2.19, I'm gonna read this in the message paraphrase, and the band can come on up. He says, what actually took place is this. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a lawman so I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I've been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It's no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. I'm no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I am not going back on that. Come on, can I get an amen on that one? You probably heard it this way. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ living in me. And the life which I now live I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the secret to overcoming the sin in your life. Hey, you're in this room, you're watching right now, you got internal bondage and deception and things you keep falling back into. Here's how you're gonna walk free. Every day, take it to the cross. God's not tired of seeing you come. He doesn't say, oh, you again? Didn't you do that sin last week? Wait a minute, Angel, get a record of this. How many times has he done this? 4,312, really? You're coming back again? It's not like that. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. When you say, Father, forgive me, you are washed whiter than snow. He doesn't see the past failure and how many times you failed. The Father sees the righteousness of his Son when you come the way of the cross. Amen? Now, a couple more thoughts. You guys got two more minutes? Two, raise your hand if you got two minutes. Two, four, six, eight, good, I'm good. Listen, when you live, the, yeah, <laughs> I like that. When you live the crucified life, it doesn't mean your ambitions and desires are gonna disappear. It just means they're gonna be lived through Christ. You might still wanna sing and dance and make a lot of money and that's all good. You're just gonna sing for the glory of God. You're gonna dance for the glory of God. You're gonna make a lot of money for the glory of God and Jesus will be at the center of it all. One more quote, Paul had no reputation, so he had nothing to fight about. He had no possession, so he had nothing to worry about. He had no rights, so he had nothing to defend. He was already broken, so no one could break him. He was dead, so no one could kill him. He'd lost everything, so no one could steal from him. He had nothing, yet he had everything because Christ, the all in all, was everything to him, for him, in him, and through him. That's the crucified life, amen? So, let's just conclude with this. What did religion lay on you that you need to get free from? What rules and legalism do you need to get free from? What did someone else's expectations lay on you that caused you to put on a facade and not live in sincerity? What hypocrisy do you need to get free from? And what internal struggle and bondage do you need to take to the cross tonight? Because it's available And Jesus wants you to live free at last. Amen? Come on, let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for your people. Thank you for your word. Lord, I I pray tonight that freedom would be the cry in every heart. Freedom from the past, freedom from bondage, freedom from struggles, and that we would know in this moment that it's available. The blood you shed for us at Calvary is still as powerful and strong as the day you died. And tonight, Lord, I pray that that grace would be on us all. Going to dismiss Napa campus. God bless you guys. Have a great ministry time.